Good day to everyone joining us, and welcome to today's XTalks webinar. Today's talk is entitled, Challenges and Considerations in Designing and Conducting Immuno-Oncology Clinical Research. My name is Vicki, and I'll be your XTalks host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes, with time for a Q&A session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive, and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box, and we'll try to attend to your questions during that Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. If you require any assistance, please contact me at any time by sending a message using this chat panel. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available for streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I would like to thank MedPace who developed the content for this presentation. MedPace is a scientifically driven, global, full-service clinical contract research organization, providing phase one to four clinical development services to the biotechnology, pharmaceutical, and medical device industries. MedPace's mission is to accelerate the global development of safe and effective medical therapeutics through its high science and disciplined operating approach that leverages local regulatory and deep therapeutic expertise across all major areas. And now I would like to introduce our speakers for today's event, Dr. Gregory Hale. Dr. Hale is a physician with over 26 years of experience in all phases of clinical development, with expertise in hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, cellular and gene therapies, and immuno-oncology. Dr. Hale has served as clinical director of the Transplant and Gene Therapy Program at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital and medical director of the Division of Hematology and Oncology at John Hopkins All Children's Hospital. Our next speaker for today is Dr. El Mustafa Bahasi. Dr. Bahasi is a research scientist with over 20 years of clinical and research laboratory experience. He's experienced in biomarker development and well-versed in various molecular biology techniques, such as DNA cloning, PCR, protein purification, mass spectrometry, flow cytometry, mouse modeling, mammalian and bacterial cell culturing, and cell-free DNA cir circulating tumor cells manipulation. And our next speaker for today is Dr. Jess Garnaschelli. Dr. Garnaschelli has 15 years of experience in clinical oncology. She is board certified in radiation oncology with clinical experience in numerous indications, including breast cancer, gynecologic cancers, and other adult solid tumors. Prior to joining MedPace, she was an assistant professor at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. During her academic career, she focused on novel treatments and supportive care of methods for patients with solid malignancies. And now, without further ado, I would like to hand the mic over to our speakers. You may begin when ready. Immuno-oncology uh, is a field that's been actually revolutionizing the treatment of many malignancies and has added a new dimension to cancer treatment. Immuno-oncology actually refers to the use of therapeutic modalities that enhance or contribute to the body's natural immune defenses in an effort to uh, treat cancer. Immuno-oncology therapies can be divided into specific and nonspecific mechanisms of action, where those having a specific mechanism are designed to recognize a specific target, and those that are acting in a nonspecific way are designed to overcome tolerance and to release the ability of the immune system to non-specifically respond to malignancy. Similarly, immuno-oncology um, modalities can be categorized as active, in which the um, host immune system is directed to induce its own response against a tumor, or passive, in which exi um, existing tumor responses are simply enhanced. Active um, modalities typically do invoke immunologic memory, while passive modalities are not associated with um, immune memory. The first FDA-approved um, immuno-oncology treatment um, in, in the recent past uh, occurred in 2011 
when the CTLA-4 um, inhibitor ipilimumab was approved to treat melanoma. Um, similarly, um, much of the initial efforts in this area focused on the PD-1, PD-L1 pathways in addition to the CTLA-4 pathway and involved um, immune um, checkpoint inhibitors. For example, PD-L1 is a receptor overexpressed on many tumor cell types, and it recognizes um, PD-1 receptors, which are found on T lymphocytes. Interaction of these two receptors leads to inhibition of T cell cytotoxicity. Therefore, inhibition of this interaction would allow potential recognition of the malignancy by the T cell evoking an immune response. Since 2011, more than 11 new cancer immunotherapies have been approved, and they have become the standard of care for a variety of cancer types, now numbering at least 15. In addition, they've been incorporated into frontline therapies for melanoma, lung cancer, and renal, renal cancer, and are expanding onto the global market. For example, from September 2017 to September 2018, there was nearly a 70% increase in agents identified as immuno-oncology agents in the global pipeline. However, these agents are associated with novel toxicities and pose certain um, unique aspects in the development of clinical trials, so caution is needed when developing clinical trials for these agents. This slide provides a brief overview of the targets for the immuno-oncology agents. Um, for example, in the recent analysis, 940 clinical stage agents were identified targeting more than 270 different targets. As you can see here, the most common target um, identified is an unspecified tumor-associated antigen. So most of these are typically vaccines, autologous tumor cell lines, autologous dendritic cells, or tumor-infiltrating lymphocytes. In addition, you'll see that the most commonly um, identified other agents target CD19 or PD-1. Immuno-oncology agents can be classified according to their mechanism of action. As you can see from this graphic illustration, the vast majority of them are cancer vaccines or immunomodulators, which target T cells or other immunomodulators. T cell targeted immunomodulators include the immune checkpoint inhibitors. In addition, newer agents such as oncolytic viruses and bispecific antibodies are also in development. Regarding immuno-oncology products specifically, cellular therapies, um, propose certain unique circumstances, which we will discuss later. Um, these therapies are typically derived from either the patient or from another person, um, the donor, and pose certain um, unique toxicities and um, considerations in operations. Um, as you can see from this slide, the nonspecific activation of the immune system is typically used in the immune checkpoint inhibitors and in cytokines, where the others tend to be somewhat more specific. As the number of immuno-oncology agents are increasingly approved for use, um, we do see that many are becoming used in combination therapies with not only other immuno-oncology agents, but in addition to chemotherapy and radiation therapy. In this graphic illustration, the size of the bubble correlates to the number of trials in which the agents are used. As you can see here, the immune checkpoint inhibitors targeting CTLA-4 are, are the most commonly used, followed by um, chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Clinical trial design for immuno-oncology patients in some instances is similar to that used for other chemotherapy agents, but does pose certain um, unique considerations. For example, immunotherapy agents have unique mechanisms of action, which may result in unique response patterns, resistant kinetics, and toxicity profiles that may be different from other um, systemic therapies. In a, a designing a trial, you first must consider um, the risk-benefit ratio, such that the toxicities posed are justified um, for the benefit, hopefully, to be elicited. In addition, choosing a current dose escalation method can be important, and depending on the concern for significant toxicity, the, um, one should consider whether or not a sentinel patient at each dose level should be enrolled. Um, an example of this would be the severe toxicity such as cytokine release syndrome posed in CAR T cell trials. In addition, definitions of the dose limiting toxicity should be um, considered. 
In general, immuno-oncology agents are somewhat slower to act, therefore toxicities may not occur in the same time period that one would anticipate them to occur as in chemotherapy agents. Similarly, the maximum tolerated dose is not always identified for this group of agents because of the slow um, time to effect, and many trials will use the recommended phase two dose as the, uh, another endpoint. Finally, defining um, expansion con cohorts it can be important. Uh, Multi-cohort um, trials are typically um, are commonly done in this indication, and one must decide um, which tumor types of these will be investigated. And finally, um, considerations for future development would pose the potential drug combination. When designing a clinical trial, site selection will be important. Um, sites should have experience in immuno-oncology. Patient eligibility criteria should be clearly identified. Specifically, the histologies to be enrolled should be, include, should be um, clearly defined. Some trials will include all tumor types, which are refractory to standard therapy, and others will be enriched for a specific tumor type. Biomarker assessment, which we'll talk about later, should be clearly defined in order to identify um, patients who are likely to respond to the therapy. Prior immunotherapeutic treatments should be carefully thought out. For example, do you want to enroll patients who are um, naive to immune checkpoint inhibitors, or do you want them to have specifically failed that modality? And finally, comorbidities, including age and performance status, are similarly important um, when looking at how um, the risk-benefit ratio is designed for patients participating in the trial. For those products that are, involve cellular products, um, collection and tracking is extremely important. That will minimize um, scheduling problems and deviations during the conduct of the clinical trial. For example, there often is a significant time interval from the time of collection to the time of product administration, and during this time interval, patients may require bridging therapy to prevent disease progression and subsequently may be at risk for additional toxicities, which may make them ineligible for subsequent infusion of the product. In addition, cell therapy manuals or apheresis manuals may be required um, and many of these cell products are handled through the stem cell laboratory of the institution rather than the pharmacy. Similarly, genetically modified products require additional regulatory considerations, such as review committees at the institutional level, such as the Institutional Biosafety Committee, and many gene-modified products do require long-term follow-up to assess patients for safety, and these need to be incorporated into the trial design. Lymphodepletion is administered in some cellular therapy trials. Um, this similarly introduces other chemotherapy agents that can be associated with adverse events, and the trial should be designed so that one is able to clearly assess relatedness um, of the adverse event to the agents in the lymphodepletion um, treatment, as well as the investigational product. And finally, response assessment and grading of adverse events are similarly important and should be dealt with prospectively. We will be, uh, Dr. Garcelli will be talking about response assessment later in the talk. And finally, when possible, health-related quality of life and patient-reported outcome evaluations should be incorporated to engage patients and to um, define patient benefits. In selecting sites um, for cellular therapy, um, one should be sure that they meet the appropriate accreditation criteria. In the United States and Canada and Australia, FACT, or the Foundation for the Accreditation of Cellular Therapies, is the most common agency um, overseeing this accreditation process. Similarly, in Europe, JC is the organization charged with this responsibility. Sites can be accredited for adult or pediatric care, or both. Sites can be accredited for cell collection, which generally is bone marrow harvest or peripheral blood stem cell collection by apheresis. They can be accredited for transplantation, which is the clinical care of the patients, and cell processing, which involves the laboratory processing of the cellular products. Within the last three years, FACT has initiated immune effector cell accreditation, which is designed specifically for programs administering immune effector cells. If sites are accredited, then it provides a layer of external validation that the sites are likely to meet all the appropriate quality mechanisms um, for conducting a transplant um, or cellular therapy trial. If sites are not accredited, then the onus uh, is on the investigator to um, ascertain whether or not the site is appropriate. 
Similarly, sites should be uh, have experience in early phase trials as well as immuno-oncology so that they are familiar with response assessments um, and other um, adverse event monitoring in this um, space. And finally, multidisciplinary teams are typically involved in trial education. For example, patients um, are typically not solely cared for on the oncology or transplant unit that may present through the emergency room or because of illness require transfer to critical care unit. In addition, as we'll talk about later, patients are, are, are at risk for neurotoxicity and therefore neurology should be involved. And so sites should have a clearly defined mechanism for involving specialists in educating those physicians caring for the patients that are not primarily involved in the oncology team. And finally, it's important to know the site, what the standard operating procedures are, and how they typically grade and manage complications and adverse events so that you will minimize um, deviations from the protocol. Patient eligibility should be very clearly um, defined. Um, this includes not only histology, but also disease status. Second, exposure to other immuno-oncology products in the past, as one may expect with increasing numbers of FDA-approved um, immuno-oncology medications, it becomes increasingly difficult to identify patients who are not naive to one of these products, particularly immune checkpoint inhibitors. Some trials will specifically seek out naive patients, others will specifically seek out patients which have failed one of these agents, and others will also define a time frame for um, the last receipt of one of these products. Patients enrolled um, on these trials have typically um, been very well defined and have excluded patients with autoimmune disease, viral infections, older age, poor performance status, or CNS disease. Many of these conditions um, are identified based on prior experience in oncology trials, as well as concerns that autoimmune disease may be exacerbated um, by immuno-oncology therapies. Finally, um, current concurrent therapeutic or supportive care trial participation should be considered and specifically outlined in the eligibility criteria or in the concomitant or prohibited medication section of the protocol. And certainly, if one is enrolling pediatric patients, then these um, patients pose additional regulatory and ethical considerations. Regarding cellular products, um, particularly when one is considering either administering CAR T cells natural killer cells or dendritic cells, um, these, one must realize that these could either be autologous cellular products derived from the patient or allogeneic products which are derived from another individual. Typically, these products are managed through the stem cell laboratory at the institution and not the hospital pharmacy. Therefore, one must be, uh, develop a good relationship and involve the stem cell laboratory in the process um, design. Um, autologous products are typically the most commonly used form of cellular therapies currently, and they create certain operational challenges. Scheduling of the donation um, of the cells by the patient so that it does not conflict with other medical care. Um, the duration of the donation includes how many days are required for apheresis and what is the time period for manufacturing of the product prior to reinfusion into the patient. During this time period, the product location should be tracked from the collection center to the manufacturer and back to the treatment center so that the site is always aware of the status of the product. And finally, product storage conditions should be clearly defined and considerations should be made in case there's a delay for infusion. Many of these products may need to be cryopreserved when possible. Certainly, one would expect changes in the patient condition from collection to treatment as some of these time periods are four to six weeks and bridging chemotherapy is often needed in the interval. Therefore, in protocol design, the use of interval therapy between collection and infusion of the cellular product should be um, defined and accounted for. And finally, um, additional instruction manuals, as well as developing mechanisms to track um, products to minimize delays are similarly important. Adverse events of immuno-oncology agents are quite unique. Um, much of the experience in the adverse event realm for these agents is obtained through immune checkpoint inhibitors, and these include the PD-1 inhibitors, PD-L1 inhibitors, and CTLA-4 inhibitors. Um, based on recent publications, there is a clear pattern of immunologic adverse events that have been defined for this group of agents, and we'll review them in subsequent slides. In general, approximately 20 to 30 percent of in single agents will have significant adverse events, while combination therapy, as one might expect, 
is associated with a higher incidence of these adverse events. <clears throat> the um, mechanism of action um, targeting the immune cells is typically um, responsible for predicting the types of adverse events. However, in contrast to chemotherapy trials, it is important to note that most ad, uh, adverse events um, are typically not dose-related, and dose adjustment is not always indicated as it is in um, routine chemotherapy trials. It is also important to note that predictive biomarkers for, the, um, develop, for patients at risk for development of adverse events have not yet been consistently identified. Concerns regarding adverse events, as one might expect in this group of agents, are associated with the uh, complications of allo or autoimmunity. Listed here, we have autoimmunity, graft versus host disease, which would be um, a complication of allogeneic um, transfer of cells from one individual to another individual, and cytokine release syndrome, and neurotoxicity, most commonly referred to as ICANs in response to cellular therapies, and macrophage activation syndrome. In reviewing toxicity, there's this, it's important to note that there may be a difference in what one is, would expect between targeted and non-targeted therapies. Much of what we've learned from immune checkpoint inhibitors, which are non-targeted therapies, highlights the complications of autoimmunity. Other more specific targets can still have an on-target off-tissue toxicity. For example, CD19-directed CAR T cells, which are designed to attack leukemia cells expressing CD19, may also um, attack and destroy um, non-malignant lymphocytes, which express CD19, resulting in hypogammaglobulinemia. Most concerns arise from the non-targeted therapies resulting in generalized inflammation and autoimmunity. Similarly, the system for grading and staging a toxicity should be clearly defined and the site should be quite familiar with it. Um, it is important to work with the site uh, and all sites participating to make sure that they are uh, aware of how to utilize the system. The assessment of toxicity should be standardized because many of these toxicities are not those that one would anticipate in a regular chemotherapy trial, and therefore one has to have a very consistent validated process by which patients are, are um, surveyed for the possibility of toxicities during therapy. Next, standardizing the management of toxicities are important. Um, for example, the protocol should clearly state or provide guidelines for when therapy should be initiated. Will it be initiated um, at a grade two level or a grade three severity? And finally, knowing what the site's standard practice and expectations are is important so that uh, deviations in the protocol can be avoided and the site can be educated in advance to prevent these deviations. This slide summarizes some of the commonly observed um, toxicities reported with immune checkpoint inhibitors and these immune-related adverse events um, can involve any um, organ system. Um, for this, I would highlight um, endocrine abnormalities, which are of reasonable concern. Hypo and hyperthyroidism are, um, are relatively more commonly observed in this group, but there's also more uncommon side effects, such as adrenal insufficiency, which can present with nonspecific symptomatology, and hypophysitis, which can also result in um, uh, endocrine abnormalities, and one has to have a um, high index of suspicion in evaluating patients for these toxicities. Similarly, there could be other uncommon toxicities, such as myocarditis, which is observed in less than 1% of patients, or more common toxicities, as one might expect, such as dermatologic or hepatitis. Not only must one have a high index of suspicion to detect these toxicities, but one must also um, be sure um, to differentiate these from infectious complications. For example, pneumonitis, hepatitis, and colitis are commonly due to infectious etiologies in um, cancer patients uh, receiving chemotherapy, but um, these can actually be due to therapy-related events in the immuno-oncology setting. One of the more common um, toxicities we see is cytokine release syndrome. This is a um, syndrome that's actually received a lot of press, both in the lay and the medical literature, because of the recent um, identification of this as a significant life-threatening complication of CAR T-cell therapy. However, cytokine release syndrome has been identified for a long time and has mainly been associated with antibody-type therapies. Cytokine release syndrome is a systemic inflammatory response characterized by fever, hypotension, tachycardia, tachypnea, and hypoxia, all relatively nonspecific um, constellation of symptoms, 
and it may also coexist with neurologic symptoms, although the two are distinct um, toxicities. In evaluating CAR T cell patients, these have been identified to be due to supraphysiologic cytokine elevations, most commonly in interleukin-6, but these toxicities can be observed after any immune effector cell engaging therapy, so they are not specific to CAR T cells. Regarding CAR T cell therapy, the median time um, to development or onset of this complication is approximately two days with the median duration of seven days. However, it has been noted that um, side effects can, this can have um, occur significantly later. Cytokine release syndrome has a wide range of severity and can be potentially fatal if diagnosed and treated early. And because of the um, nonspecific nature of the symptoms, infection should be considered and treated in, um, when this develops. Regarding neurotoxicity, um, regarding neurotoxicity in relationship to CAR T cell therapies, immune effector cell associated neurotoxicity syndrome, or ICANS, has been the new, newly developed terminology. It previously was referred to as CAR related encephalopathy syndrome, or CREST, and it too is due to a uh, cytokine elevation, as um, CRS is. Um, ICANS is a constellation of encephalopathic signs and symptoms that are relatively specific but should involve a neurologist in the diagnosis and management. These patients typically present with the inability to speak or aphasia, altered level of consciousness, impaired cognition, motor weakness, seizures, and cerebral edema, once again, all relatively nonspecific neurologic symptoms. Char uh, the characteristic patient is one who is awake but unable to speak and does not respond well to verbal or, or physical stimulation by the examiner. As we mentioned earlier, these toxicities may exist concurrently or independently of cytokine release syndrome, and they can occur after any immune effector cell engaging therapies, just as cytokine release syndrome can. Following CAR T cell therapy, ICANS typically presents somewhat later than cytokine um, release syndrome, with a median onset of seven days post infusion and a median duration of 14 days. Finally, a relatively rare um, toxicity is macrophage activation syndrome, which is similarly a systemic inflammatory syndrome characterized by fever, splenomegaly, hepatomegaly, hyperferritinemia, pancytopenia, hepatic dysfunction or elevation um, in bilirubin or transaminases, as well as a coagulopathy. Hemophagocytosis, which is the engulfment of red blood cells by macrophages, may or may not be observed in the bone marrow and is not required for diagnosis. This rare condition is associated with elevations in CD25 and CD163, which can be used as um, diagnostic testing to support the clinical diagnosis. And this, is, this disorder is typically seen most commonly in patients with rheumatologic conditions and in patients with hemophagocytosis, lymphohistiocytosis. Because these adverse events are not terribly common and may occur long after the therapy has been administered or discontinued, patients should continue to be followed for a um, significant time period following participation in trials regarding these agents. Most of these toxicities can be managed if they are recognized early, and therefore it's important to identify sites who have medical teams that are well experienced in the care of patients receiving immuno-oncology agents. Uh, providers and patients both should be educated regarding the toxicity so that patients are aware of how to seek care and that patients are able to provide providers, whether it's the emergency room or another setting, about their treatment of potential toxicities. Similarly, systematic laboratory testing and history and physical in all patients should include a structured methodology for assessment of side effects to allow for early detection. In assessing the severity of adverse events, a variety of options are available. Um, the, when de designing a study, the um, adverse event defining criteria should be clearly specified. The common terminology criteria for adverse events is um, commonly used because it covers a wide variety of organ systems and most commonly does have criteria for cytokine release syndrome. Cytokine release syndrome criteria have been developed and there are a variety to choose from. Uh, one of the initial versions, Lee et al., published in 2014, has been commonly used, but there's also other um, possibilities, including those developed at the University of Pennsylvania, Memorial Sloan Kettering, as well as the um, CARTOX criteria. The ASBMT, or American Society of Blood and Marrow Transplantation, has recently um, 
published a consensus criteria statement that includes cytokine release syndrome as well as ICANs, and this is a likely um, this is the newest criteria and will likely be increasingly used in the future as this has been developed through um, concurrence of a variety of cellular therapy professionals. And finally, graft versus host disease has a variety of criteria, not only for acute graft versus host disease, as we see here with modified Glucksberg criteria, the IBMTR severity index, or the MAGIC criteria, but also other criteria for um, chronic graft versus host disease. Treatment typically involves trying to dampen the immunologic response. For toxicities that are greater than or equal to grade two regarding immune checkpoint inhibitors, the, in, the medication is typically held. Steroid therapy is typically initiated if for toxicities that are greater than or equal to grade three, and the immune checkpoint inhibitor is typically permanently discontinued. Steroids remain a mainstay of therapy for treatment of these immunologic adverse events with the one consideration that they may also ameliorate the anti-tumor effect of the agent. Second-line therapies are available um, for immune checkpoint inhibitor toxicities, including infliximab or a, an anti-tumor necrosis factor agent for GI toxicity or mycophenolate mofetil for hepatic toxicity. For cytokine release syndrome, other agents that inhibit IL-6 or its receptor are tocilizumab or siltuximab. Immuno-oncology is a rapidly growing area that poses questions regarding the development of clinical trials. These include patient conditions, which comorbidities are tolerated for enrollment, which diseases, what is the level of disease, what concomitant treatments are permitted, what prior therapies are allowed, what is the role of combination therapies at some point in the development of the trial, while they may not be indicated in the initial early stage development of these agents, their use um, subsequently may be a consideration. In addition, the mechanisms by which tumor escapes or, or develops disease recurrence um, is important to define. And finally, developing biomarkers for patients that are likely to benefit from each type of therapy are important, as well as biomarkers to identify those that are at high risk for toxicity. At this point, I'll hand off the presentation to Dr. El Mustafa Bahase for a discussion of biomarkers. Thank you, Dr. Hale. Um, for this part on current biomarkers in immuno-oncology, um, I will start with this generic definition uh, of a biomarker. So a, a biomarker is a measurable biological factor that can provide insights into each patient's individual cancer, which doctors can then use to determine uh, the approach most likely to benefit a particular person. Um, but the term biomarker, um, just first slide, please. Uh, the term biomarker is becoming more complex as the drug development paradigm is evolving from uh, chemotherapy to targeted therapy. Um, the targets is either, either a single gene such as EGFR in lung cancer or even a single amino acid such as the B12 in KRAS to um, immunotherapy. But compared to chemotherapy, um, you know, or even targeted therapy, immuno-oncology biomarkers are a lot more complex, and they require new approaches that involve uh, genomics, uh, digital pathology, uh, proteomics, uh, transcriptomics, um, and more. Next slide. So um, in the precision medicine era, we went from an approach where one size fits all to a stratification approach using different types of biomarkers mainly uh, predictive and prognostic uh, biomarkers allowing us to stratify patients based on uh, genomic and proteomic signatures. And this allows us to cluster um, these um, defined groups uh, where um, they are linked then to a particular uh, treatment. Next slide. So as Dr. Hale, um, has shown uh, earlier, there are currently multiple approaches to immunotherapy in cancer. And you certainly heard about the immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, you heard about adoptive T cell transfer, uh, such as CAR T cell, also about cancer vaccines and immune system activators, et cetera. However, immune checkpoint inhibitors are currently the backbone of immunotherapy and will be the, the subject of today's presentation. 
Um, so a wide variety of biomarkers have been associated with immune responsiveness. And um, therefore, a variety of platforms and assays are needed in the assessment of patient response to um, specific therapy. And I will cover four of the most important, the most promising biomarkers in immune oncology. Um, so the first one is PDL1 PDL expression. So PDL1 is the most promising biomarker currently um, in the clinic and has shown utility. Um, the second um, biomarker I'll talk about is the pre-existing immunity. Uh, so the immune uh, function and regulation plays a critical role in response to immune checkpoint inhibitors, um, such as the level of tumor infiltrating cells, um, CD4 um, and CD8 positive uh, PLR T cells. Uh, the third um, uh, biomarker, the emerging biomarker that they want to talk about is the tumor genomic instability. Um, so tumor genomic instability uh, tumor mutation burden mostly, and microsatellite instability. Um, both of those can lead to class one and class two new antigens that can boost the immune system. And the fourth uh, emerging biomarker that I want to talk about is the microbiome and the virome. Um, the gut microbiome and viral infections all have been shown to prime the immune system to attack um, the tumor. Next slide, please. So, as um, mentioned earlier, um, so PDN, PDL1 is the most promising, promising biomarker currently in the clinic. Um, and the good thing about it is that it's easy to use. Uh, any institution can be, um, can have access to immunohistochemistry um, um, instruments, and then it can be done, uh, it can be performed uh, at different sites. Um, the uh, PDL1 expression at the surface of cancer cells shuts down the anti-tumor uh, killer T cells, and blocking PDL1, PD1, PDL1 pathway can overcome uh, this suppression. And um, like mention, um, I mentioned earlier, that high PDL1 expression can identify patients more likely to benefit from immune um, checkpoint blockers. Next slide, please. So um, currently, FDA has approved um, seven checkpoint inhibitors since 2011, and there are over a thousand ongoing clinical trials um, in this space. Um, next slide. Next slide, please. Um, so in this 2015 study uh, by Robert C. Al, um, you know, um, there was a significant survivorship in melanoma patients treated with PD-1 inhibitor. Uh, nivolumab uh, compared to patients treated with chemotherapy, and that highlights the importance of PD-1 as a biomarker, not only in melanoma, but across multiple indications. Next slide, please. So, um, indeed, nearly all human tumors include a subset that expresses PD-L1. So, for instance, I'm showing here on the right uh, squamous cell carcinoma and adeno um, uh, non small cell lung car cancer has 50%, 45% to 50% expression of PDL1, colon cancer, a melanoma, renal cancer, and then a number of other cancer types do express um, high levels of PDL1. Um, so, however, um, some patients whose, tumor, whose tumors do, do not express any PDL1 can still respond. To these immunotherapies due to the dynamic nature of PDL1 expression, which even if absent at certain stage of tumor development, can be expressed later. Um, and vice versa, there are some tumors that do, do uh, um, express PDL1 and yet do not respond to checkpoint blockers, highlighting the need to take uh, a more holistic approach when it comes to immuno oncology therapy. Next, next slide, please. So um, obviously, this is a very highly competitive landscape um, that involves a number of companies, um, a number of approaches, a number, a number, a number of molecules in development. And uh, currently, four of the leading drug developers have FDA-approved um, drugs that target either PD-1 or PD-L1 um, that have been um, approved for um, different indications. Each one of these companies. Um, have partnered with different in vitro diagnostics companies like DACO and Ventana 
to develop antibody clones for PD-1 or PD-L1. And the problem is each one of these companies has, they have established um, different scoring cutoffs to define what is positive expression. Um, so all this led to multiple challenges related to mapping of assays and cutoff values and um, therapies that are complicated and highly dynamic. Um, so, so at this point, there is a need to search for solutions for assay uh, standardization and automated solutions. Um, and there are multiple efforts actually to harmonize assay format understanding of performance um, that are being taken by um, the FDA and by the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer. Next slide. So the other, the second promising biomarker that um, I want to talk about and that can predict the response to immune checkpoint inhibitors is the pre-existing immunity. So we know that cytotoxic T cells, which are the primary factors of adaptive immunity, detect and destroy tumor cells. And um, many studies have shown that patients whose tumors are already infiltrated by killer T cells, uh, mainly CD8 positive and CD4 positive, typically experience, experience better outcomes and are more likely to respond to anti PD-1, uh, PD-L1 checkpoint, checkpoint immunotherapy. Next slide, please. So the third um, important and emerging uh, biomarker in immunology is the tumor mutational burden. Um, we all know that mutations are responsible for cancer initiation and progression, but those mutations, those same mutations, can also make tumors stand out uh, to the immune system. In another word, these mutations can lead to somatic mutations. Um, and, and, and some of them can be somatic mutations. And a minority of those somatic mutations in the tumor can give rise to new antigens uh, that are recognized and targeted by the immune system. Um, on the right, you can see the uh, famous study from RISV et al, uh, where they used exome sequencing to determine tumor mutation burden in non-small cell lung cancer patients uh, treated with uh, pembrolizumab. And um, they have shown that uh, patients with, um, that are heavily mutated um, are more likely to respond to anti PD1, PDL1 immunotherapy. Um, and uh, currently, the FDA has approved um, two NGS panels um, that can be used to estimate tumor mutation burden and include the MSK impact panel and the Foundation 1 CDX panel with other solutions being developed. Um, in May 2017, immunotherapy approval, there was an immunotherapy approved for the MSI microsatellite high mismatch repair uh, defective uh, in solid tumors after the landmark study that showed that mismatch repair deficiency predicts the response to um, of solid, solid tumors to PD-1 blockade. Uh, next slide, please. So I think everyone is familiar with um, this slide here. Uh, where, um, you know, the tumor mutation burden um, was, uh, you know, shown in multiple tumor type types. And as you can see on the far right, melanoma by far has the most, um, you know, somatic mutations um, and also lung cancer and bladder cancer and, and small cell lung cancer. And those, um, you know, being the most um, you know, the tumors with the most tumor mutation burden, um, they are also known to be the most responsive to um, immune um, checkpoint inhibitors. Next slide. So the fourth uh, promising biomarker in immune oncology is the microbiome. So a number of studies have shown that gut microbiome may influence uh, the anti-tumor immune response by means of innate and adaptive immunity. Um, trillions of bacteria reside in our intestines. Um, higher gut diversity also is associated with higher response rates after anti PD1, uh, PD PDL1 checkpoint immunotherapy. And um, also, in antibiotic use is associated with worse survival after checkpoint immunotherapy. Next slide, please. So, um, this study from 2018. Um, has looked at oral and gut microbiome of melanoma patients undergoing um, anti-PD-1 immunotherapy. 
and uh, it shows an increased progression free, free survival in patients with uh, favorable gut microbiome. Um, you know, from the same study, metagenomic studies revealed functional differences in gut bacteria in, response, uh, in responders, including enrichment of anabolic pathways, um, including amino acid synthesis, uh, and also that immune profiling uh, suggested enhanced systemic and anti-tumor immunity in responding patients with a fav favorable gut microbiome, including a higher density of effector uh, CD8 positive, CD4 positive T cells. Next slide, please. So um, just to summarize, um, you know, multiple biomarker assays that are available for assessment of efficacy of immuno-oncology therapies on cells, uh, tissues, and nucleic acids. Um, different PDL1 assays are in development, but they pose multiple challenges. So we have different monoclonal antibodies, um, different assay platforms, different scoring criteria and cutoffs. And then there's a utility for different indications. There is a need for assay format um, uh, harmonization to address the analytical uh, performance variability between these um, assays. So the current situation does present a variety of challenges for development and commercial commercialization of these assays. So um, responders to immune checkpoints have higher uh, tumor mutation burden in non-small cell lung cancer, in bladder cancer, and melanoma. Not all uh, tumor um, mutation burden high responders and vice, and, 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 uh, vice versa respond um, similarly. So um, there is, and also the problem with using tumor mutation burden in the clinic is that it, it is very challenging as the technology may not be easily accessible at all sites. The mismatch, um, the uh, microsatellite instability and uh, mismatch repair deficiency in colorectal cancer patients does indeed imp improve a response to PD-1, uh, PD PD-L1 therapy, but application to other cancer types is uh, very uncertain. Uh, so th there is definitely a need for a more integrative approach to biomarkers in immuno-oncology that were required combining um, findings from PDL1 expression levels, uh, tumor mutation burden, uh, microsatellite instability, um, transcriptomic signatures, proteomics, epigenomics. So all this will require some advanced bioinformatics tools, um, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. So this is um, a work in progress. With that, I would um, pass it on to Dr. Jesse uh, Jess, uh, Gonacelli, uh, to um, for the last part of the talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bahasi. So the objective of this final section is to summarize the response evaluation criteria in solid tumors. Familiarity with the old and updated resist criteria and how to apply them is essential in day-to-day -day work with oncology clinical trials. The immune response criteria, IRRC, PERSIST, IR resist, IRENO, I resist, account for novel response patterns seen with immunotherapies. Each new addition must be validated before use, and there's a formal process for new criteria. Clinical trials depend on imaging endpoints to predict survival. Radiographic responses in immuno-oncology therapies are unlike responses to chemotherapy, where tumor cell killing and tumor reduction are more immediate. The flare effect, or pseudoprogression, in immuno-oncology describes the initial tumor size increase followed by delayed response and shrinkage. This is thought to be due to T cell infiltration. Image response criteria for traditional chemotherapeutics are not appropriate for immuno-oncology. Accurate endpoints of clinical response to immuno-oncology is important. Without it, successful trials may fail or terminate prematurely and unnecessarily. Here is a historical timeline which illustrates how the image response criteria has evolved. If we look all the, all the way back to 1981, the very first imaging response criteria developed was the World Health Organization criteria. As legend tells it, it's based on a small meeting that occurred with a group of oncologists in a hotel room. 
That was the origin of all imaging criteria for tumor response. So as you can see, the history dates back almost 40 years. And in the interest of time, the scope of this brief talk will include a review of World Health Organization, RESIST version 1.0, RESIST version 1.1, and the iResist. So setting up the design for the clinical trial study is key. The primary endpoint in most oncology trials is patient survival. Overall survival is a clinical endpoint and consider, considered gold standard. It is not always practical due to the need for high patient numbers and required time. Progression-free survival measures time from treatment initiation to beginning of disease progression. It is the most commonly used endpoint. And another important endpoint is objective response rate. It measures the proportion of patients with a reduction in tumor burden by a predetermined amount. The most widely used response criteria for malignant tumors is RESIST. In RESIST 1.0 and 1.1, the tumor growth is classified as disease progression. Tumor shrinkage simply defines response to treatment. In RESIST, tumor response assessment was categorized as follows. Complete response, which means disappearance of all target lesions, partial response, stable disease, and progressive disease. So which imaging techniques and modalities are used? While the earlier imaging criteria, such as WHO and RESIST 1.0, did use modalities such as chest X-ray, in the modern era, CT scans and MRI are most often used. With CT scans, IV contrast should be consistently administered. If there is no IV contrast, lesions, lesion assessment may not be possible and or may be inaccurate. So if a patient is on a clinical trial and has a contraindication to IV contrast, it's important that that's documented. In some circumstances, such as in gastrointestinal malignancies, patients may need oral contrast. Slice thickness for CT scans should be less than or equal to five millimeters. One of the major changes in RESIST 1.1 as compared to 1.0 is the inclusion of FDG PET in detection of new lesions that define progression. The inclusion of FDG PET, which displays glucose metabolism of the tumor, adds a new functional aspect of response assessment to RESIST 1.1, which before that time was solely based on morphologic assessment using size measurements only. In more recent pediatric studies, FDG MRI may be used. I'd like to take a moment to give you an overview of RESIST, the response evaluation criteria in solid tumors. This established reproducible imaging standards. It's based on the initial WHO criteria. It was established in 2000 and updated in 2009. Tumor burden is based on the sum of diameters. These are unidimensional measurements, unlike WHO, which was bidimensional. RESIST might pose a challenge at local imaging sites as anonymized assessments are preferred for clinical trials. It is important to understand the development of RESIST 1.0 and 1.1 and how it led to our most recent immune response evaluation criteria for solid tumors. For RESIST 1.0, Imaging used for chest X-ray, CT, and MRI, and the target lesions were measured by their longest diameter. For RESIST 1.0, a rule for measuring lymph nodes was not yet specified. For the first RESIST version, radiologists can, could select up to 10 target lesions and a max of five per organ. The first definition of progressive disease was greater than 20% increase in the sum of longest diameter and or new lesions. In 2000, the updated simplified version 1.1 attempted to improve upon and streamline the first version 1.0. In version 1.1, FDG PET was incorporated. Radiologists can label a maximum of five target lesions and a maximum of two lesions per organ. With fewer target lesions to follow, this allowed for more attention to, to discordance and variability. Like in version 1.0, radiologists give a score, which is the sum of the diameters of the target lesions. That is the sum of the longest diameter of each lesion plus the short axis diameter of each lymph node. Based on the resist, 
there may be several outcomes of tumor response, and they are as follows. Complete response, no visible lesions or disease, and all lymph nodes less than 10 millimeters diameter. Partial response, which is greater than or equal to 30% reduction of some of diameters of the target lesions. Stable disease, less than 30% reduction or greater than 20% increase in SOD and progressive disease, which is any new lesion or greater than 20% increase in sum of diameters from nadir and or absolute increase of greater than five millimeters. Before moving on, I'd like to give illustrative examples of imaging modalities on which tumors are measurable per resist. The first on the left, image A, illustrates a CT scan axial image through the lungs of a 59-year-old man with a metastatic rectal carcinoma in the lung. There is a lobulated metastatic lesion measuring 2.5 centimeters in longest diameter, and it does meet the criteria for measurable disease as the lesion's longest diameter is greater than 10 millimeters. The next image, image B, shows a CT scan axial slice through the abdomen. Um, this is also measurable based on CT. The longest diameter is greater than 10 millimeters. It measures 2.1 centimeters. And lastly, image C shows a simple frontal chest X-ray showing a mass with the longest diameter of 4.2 centimeters. And based on resist 1.0 for X-rays, the longest diameter must be greater than 20 millimeters. So how are tumor response assessments actually done in clinical practice? Well, on this slide, we have a baseline abdomen CT of a 59-year-old man with colon cancer. On these images, you can see the axial slice of a CT scan through the abdomen. On the top row, image 1A and 1B reveal two separate metastatic liver lesions. Measurements at baseline, according to RESIST, are 4.6, image 1A, and 5.4 centimeters, image 1B, totaling 10 centimeters, which is the sum of diameters. Follow-up CT scan, represented by image 2A and 2B, these scans are done after initiation of therapy and show a decrease in size of the target liver lesions. The resist measurements are 3.3 and 2.7 centimeters, totaling six centimeters, given a 40% reduction in some of measurements of target lesions relative to baseline. So this is, you can go back, sorry, is a partial response. This slide illustrates the maximum number of target lesions allowed according to RESIST 1.0 and RESIST version 1.1. The RESIST version 1.1 has been reduced to allowing up to two target lesions per organ. On image A, CT scan axial slice, um, this shows um, a pancreatic mass in the center and there are also multiple metastatic lesions in the liver. If you were to use RESIST 1.0, up to five lesions per organ are represented here. Then on image B, same CT axial slice of an abdomen. Here with RESIST version 1.1, it allows labeling of only two lesions per organ. You can tell by this illustration that RESIST 1.1 simplifies the classification for a diagnostic radiologist and allows for more attention to be delivered to the consistency of the lesions measured over time. This illustration demonstrates the axial CT slice of a woman with small cell lung cancer who was treated with erlotinib. Image A reveals the CT of her chest with a spiculated right lung lesion, which was her only target lesion with a longest diameter of 2.8 centimeters. Image B reveals the CT of her chest after one cycle of therapy. The lesion now measures 1.3 centimeters, showing a 54% reduction in size compared with baseline. This change is consistent with a partial response. Then image C reveals that after initial response, small residual tumor is slowly increasing in size, and at this time point measures 1.7 centimeters on the follow-up CT study. So the patient's nadir image revealed a lesion at 1.3 centimeters, and assessment using 1.0 would deem this to be progressive disease now, and therapy would be stopped. However, using updated RESIST 1.1, assessment is stable disease because the absolute increase in size is less than five millimeters. Then another follow-up CT scan represented by image D shows further increase in size of residual tumor with longest diameter of two 
which meets criteria for progressive disease by resist 1.1, giving the 54% increase and a six millimeter absolute increase in size compared with the patient's nadir. So why use I resist for immune oncology? Well, resist 1.0 and 1.1 had limitations in assessing, in assessing pseudoprogression and flare responses seen in immune oncology. The I resist criteria resets the bar if resist defines an enlarging lesion as progressive disease. I resist standardizes and validates immune response criteria. So what is new with iResist? It takes flare effect into account, the immune sum of diameters for new target lesions. There are a new set of definitions and rules for confirmation of progression of disease. First, resist progression of disease is IUPD, or immune unconfirmed progression of disease with a new iResist. As mentioned earlier, the important thing about iResist is that there is a resetting of the bar if iResist, if resist progressive disease is followed by tumor shrinkage at the next time point measurement. So on this graph, if you look to the right, one can see that from baseline to time point one, the target lesion increased in size by greater than 20%. By resist 1.1, this is documented as progressive disease. With iResist, the bar is reset and it is labeled as immune unconfirmed progressive disease. The target lesion then decreases in size and at time point two is 20% smaller than its initial size at baseline. It is now defined as immune stable disease. At time point three, it continues to have decrease in size and meets the criteria for partial response from baseline. And by time point five, the target lesion has again enlarged and may be considered as immune progress, progression of disease. So in conclusion, immunotherapies are major advances in treatments of numerous cancers. Tr trials with immuno-oncology in multiple clinical settings, adjuvant, postoperative, first, second, and subsequent lines of therapy will require use of progression-based endpoints. The FDA guidance on oncology image, imaging uses RESIST 1.1. However, RESIST 1.1 might not adequately capture unique patterns and responses of immuno-oncology drugs. Trials testing immuno-oncology in combination with standard therapies, chemotherapy, radiation, novel treatment entities, further confound assessment of progression-based endpoints. The design of randomized studies planned for licensing applications should continue to use RESIST 1.1 as the primary criteria for response-based endpoints, and iResist can be reserved um, and can be regarded as an explore, exploratory endpoint in such trials, an earlier phase trial. Before I complete, <clears throat> I'd like to credit Dr. Scott Holland and Dr. Adina, as well as the MedPACE Imaging Core Lab, Dr. Adina and Scott Holland help run the Imaging Core Lab out of our Cincinnati-based campus, Leon, France, and Beijing, China. They cover the full range of imaging modalities in all therapeutic areas. And in addition, they support many of our immune oncology and radiopharmaceutical trials and provide robust support in radiation therapy, physics, and dosimetry. Thank you very much. That concludes our presentation for today. It's now an opportunity for questions and answers. We have one question that will be for Dr. Garnaschelli. Um, in your experience with clinical trials for immuno-oncology, is there a preferred imaging modality that should be used if the goal is central independent image review using iResist criteria? Thank you. Um, so CT is most commonly used and accepted and widely available. <clears throat> MRI provides excellent image resolution and soft tissue contrast and is preferred for solid tumors in some organs. However, MRI is more expensive, it's more demanding for patients, and may require a higher level of expertise at the clinical trial imaging center or lab and radiology um, diagnostic readers. 
Other modalities can be used, but are <clears throat> not as well validated or accepted for the regulatory purposes. Thank you, Dr. Garnaschelli. And we have another question. Um, and this one will be for Dr. Bahasi, it looks like. It involves biomarkers. Um, what effects would prior cytotoxic therapies have when immune checkpoint inhibitors respond? Oh, thank you. Uh, that's a great question. Um, the um, prior uh, treatment with either immuno, um, with um, chemotherapy um, or radiation would definitely increase the number of mutations, and that number of mutations would translate to a certain number of thematic mutations that would produce new antigen um, that will activate the immune system. So, so definitely prior treatment with uh, chemotherapy or radiation or even uh, PARP inhibitors that will inhibit DNA repair pathways will have um, a, a great effect on um, response to immunotherapy. Thank you very much, Dr. Bahasi. I think that concludes the questions and answer session of our talk, and I'll now turn the um, program back to Vicki. Great. Well, thank you very much for that insightful presentation and that informative Q&A session. And as Dr. Hill said, we have reached the end of the Q&A portion. However, if you do have any further questions, please direct them to the contact information showing on your screen. And here we have an email address that is info at medpace.com. And thank you everyone for participating in today's conference. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen and your participation is greatly appreciated as it will help to improve our future webinars. Now please join us in thanking our speakers, Dr. Gregory Hale, Dr. El Mustafa Bahasi, and Dr. Dress Garnashelli. And feel free to share this webinar by clicking the link in the chat box. We hope you have found this conference informative. Have a great day, everyone.